Welcome, everybody. This is a great, isn't it, isn't it nice to have your shots and be a little braver and come out and still be safe? This is, this is a great venue, and, and look at our, our virtual attendees, too. So wave, wave to everybody. Um, so, uh, so welcome to um, meetings uh, pandemic style, um, which means it expands our possibilities. We now have four ways to attend the Historical Society meetings. Of course, those in the audience at the Wayne, those who are up on Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook. So this, there should be no excuse not to attend a Historical Society meeting from now on. Um, before we get into the program, I just want to give you a couple updates on other events that are happening with the Historical Society. One of the first ones is uh, we've got an exhibit that's, that's opening up. Um, Right now, of course, our exhibits are going to be uh, timed exhibits. It's, they're free, but you'll have to sign up to, uh, to visit, and you'll be getting emails, e-blasts about, about that. But this exhibit, you know, as the summer goes on, hopefully people get uh, their shots and we'll be able to open up a little bit more. Um, but it's called um, Music and Miniatures of Note in the Valley. So it's a combination of two vastly different things that we're putting together into one exciting exhibit. The miniatures part are historical dioramas, five historical dioramas that a, a guy named Gary Whistleman from Greenville, who has done, uh, created these little miniature dioramas for places like the Museum of the American Revolution, um, has put together five sort of snapshots of history in, in, the, in the Augusta County area, including the burning from the Civil War, um, Ned Tarr's uh, Blacksmith Forge, he was the first African-American um, landowner west of the Blue Ridge Mountains. So these are interesting little exhibits. We even have uh, magnifying glasses because these are miniatures, so they're tiny little people, and, and, um, and we'll have interpretive panels and books that you might want to read to learn more about the scene you're looking at. So that's part of the exhibit. The other part is going to be Shenandoah Valley uh, music and the history of it. So the history of it um, all the way up to the present, and that's being co-curated um, with uh, Don DePoy and uh, Martha Hills. Me and Martha, the, the um, traditional uh, bluegrass group from this area, and, and so they're gonna be DVDs and, and hopefully live performances in our garden um, as the summer goes on of some of our contemporary traditional music musicians that are here. So both of those portions of the exhibit should, should work into a very nice exhibit that'll be open from the end of April until the, the first week of, of September. So make sure you come to see that. You'll be getting lots more communication from us about that. Um, the other thing, um, and, and some of the other, just to give you um, some tidbits of, about that musical portion of the exhibit is the amazing story of Stanton's Putnam organs, um, which, which is a pretty big deal. Um, we'll have a working Putnam organ there um, that we'll probably do some little mini concerts on. The story of the Middlebrook Waltz, and I'm not going to tell you any more about that. You'll have to find that out. Um, and then learning more about the, just the Shenandoah Valley Music Trail. The other thing I want to call your attention to is um, that the program that many of you have enjoyed over the last few years, it's, it's actually our most popular program, I would guess, is Conversations from the Grave, which is our live tours of Thorn Rose Cemetery where you meet uh, six or seven characters who spend their eternity in Thorn Rose and just come to life for our special program. Um, it was supposed to happen last year, and of course, we know what happened last year. So it's tentatively scheduled. Right now, we're planning for it to be September 18th and 19th. Um, stay tuned as we learn more about COVID protocols and, and regulations and, and things like that. But we're, we're planning on um, bringing the characters of Thorn Rose back to life once again in September. And then also, while you're here in person, um, just know that we've got a little mini gift shop out in the lobby. So if you missed our, our uh, fall meeting or if you saw the fall meeting and would like to, to have that DVD that shadows about the families that were displaced off Shenandoah National Park. If you'd like to have that for your own, that DVD is for sale out in the lobby for $12. We also have a few copies of our um, Augusta County Images book, which is the photographic 
history of, of Augusta County. It's a collection of, of historic photographs. It's divided up into like farms and people and community organizations and fun and games. And it, that's a that's a, a great book to just look at old pictures and 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 think of what it was like back when. Um, and the final thing is we have one copy left of our Lucy Sims book. And Lucy Sims was this, um, an amazing educator in the Harrisonburg and Rockingham County school system. She was born a slave on a farm that's now in the city of Harrisonburg. And right after the war, got her education at Hampton and got her teaching credentials there, came back and taught for almost 60 years in the Harrisonburg and Rockingham school systems. And she's actually gonna be on a monument in Richmond, a, a new monument to African Americans who played a role in, in Virginia's um, post-war history and, and were real um, instrumental in, in carving out that, that important part of our history. So uh, it's a fascinating story and, um, and from, from enslavement to public service. So we've got one more copy there and then we've got to go get more copies from the Harrisonburg Rockingham Historical Society now called Rocktown. Um, Rocktown history and um, so grab up that last one if you want and you'll be supporting the historical society as well. So before we get to our program we have I promised this was going to be a very short business meeting but we have to do it. Um, during the pandemic we have actually taken the time to organize our archives. Um, we haven't we haven't been idle um, just because we closed our doors to the public didn't mean we closed our doors to our internal workings and carrying out our, our mission of preserving the past for the future. So one of the things that we did is we took a look at our, a really hard look at our bylaws. For instance, there are things that maybe we didn't think about in, in 2012, which is the last time we looked at our bylaws, like what happens if there's a pandemic and you have to have a Zoom board meeting. So we had um, a team of, of two, Christiana Shields who's here today and Peyton Hamrick, uh, of our board members who really took a hard look at our, our um, bylaws, brought them to our board um, and discussed them and we passed a, a revised set of bylaws that Christiana's gonna tell you about. But our bylaws also say that we have to take it to the membership and get your approval. So Christiana's gonna come up here and talk to you about that and hopefully this won't take, this is not painful at all and she'll come up and do that and then we'll get right to the program. All right, thank you, Nancy, because what is more exciting than listening to bylaws changes? I know you're all excited about that. Oh, there you go. Um, basically, we had a few changes. There weren't actually that many, despite the fact they had not been amended since 2012. So I'm just going to give you a very, very brief synopsis of things we changed. They were available um, on all the e-blasts and emails that Nancy sent out. Um, so if any of you were really interested, you could have taken a look there, but otherwise I'll just give you a quick, quick synopsis. Um, classes of membership were changed, you know, from family, individual, institutional. We updated those to a fewer groups to uh, reflect our current membership. That was a little bit outdated. There were some groups that didn't really make sense. Um, then the next major section that was changed were committees. There were a whole bunch of committees. And as much as we love committees on our board, we took those and consolidated them, um, deleted a few, added a few more, you know, basically like the bulletin committee was wrapped into the publications committee, um, things like that. So nothing too serious. We also added a Smith Center committee since the Augusta County Historical Society is now housed in the Smith Center. So that's a fairly big, a big part of what we need to concentrate on. And then finally, the last thing um, which Nancy alluded to was we updated our language in Article 14, electronic and mail communications, and we added um, Article 15, which is all about remote participation in annual and special meetings and events. Um, and for that, Peyton, who was, uh, really took the lead on this, she went to the Virginia Code section um, to make sure that we were following the rules and regulations and the laws. 
and we, so we use that to update um, Article 14 and add Article 15, which basically allows us to function by Zoom and email as a board and for special committees in order to get things passed. So that's the gist of it. Nothing too earth shaking, I don't think. Um, if we could have someone make a motion to approve the amended changes, that would be great. Rick Chittam, a second? Excellent. If all in favor could say aye. aye. And, and people on Zoom. Oh, and if anyone's on Zoom, um, if you want to say aye or nay, um, you can add it in the comments section or thumbs up on YouTube or Facebook. Facebook. You can you can make your opinion felt and that'll give us more of a record. Do I have to do the nays as well? Anybody? Nay? Excellent. Did we, first? Okay. we did eyes first. Were we supposed to do the nays first? No. No. Okay, I think, can we say we're approved? I think it's passed and I thank you all very much and we have updated bylaws 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christiana. See, I told you that wasn't too painful. Um, thank you all at Zoom for doing your thumbs up there so we have a record of this. Um, so, now we get to the main reason that you all are here. Um, so Dennis Blanton, who is a James Madison University professor of anthropology and, and historical society board member, is going to present mounds in our midst, the ancient monuments of the Valley's first people. First people. And there's no better person, I think, than Dennis to tell this story. And I, I'm going to tell you just a short, short story of my own why I think that's the case. Just like a lot of you who live in Augusta County, um, on some land in Augusta County, I have a box of stone points that were picked up in the yard and the garden and the pasture where I, where I grew up. They're, they're pretty cool, and I think we all kind of are in awe of their antiquity, but we know very little about them. Well, uh, a couple years ago, I, was, I showed them to Dennis, and he just took the box of points and he dumped them out, and within a minute, he had them all arranged chronologically, um, you know, and, and it was a period of several thousand years a span of several thousand years, and, and then he would pick up a certain point and say, well, this came from stone over on this mountain, or this would have come down from Amherst County, or, or something like that. So um, I was just in awe of that, and, um, and I knew right then that, that this would be a good talk someday, and when he volunteered at our board meeting to do it, I didn't let him say, say no. I, we had him signed up before he had a chance to rethink his volunteering. Um, so let me just tell you, a little bit more about him. He got his undergraduate degree from the University of Georgia, his master's at Brown, and his PhD at the University of Virginia. And he is an expert in early colonial and Native American cultures of the Mid-Atlantic and the Southeast and Southeastern United States. His archaeological research has been published in numerous books and journals. And his latest book, Conquistador's Wake, Tracking the Legacy of Hernando de Soto in the Indigenous Southeast, was published in 2020 by the University of Georgia Press. And even though that's not Augusta County, I think that would make a fascinating program as well. So what's he going to talk about today? Well, he wrote this little blurb, and I'll just read it again. Eight centuries ago, Augusta County was at the hub of Native American territory marked by numerous earthen mounds. The practice of mound building was quite unique to this part of Virginia, and it did not occur for long. At least a dozen of these special burial mounds were created, and they are concentrated within a 35-mile radius of today's Stanton. Those mounds intrigued the valley's first European settlers, and they obviously continue to intrigue us today. That's why we're all here, either in person or virtually. So I'm going to let Dennis tell us all about that culture. I should also say there'll be lots of, I'm sure, lots of exciting questions afterward. Why don't you hold your questions till the end, but if you're on Zoom or, or Facebook and you want to type them in, because... Zoom people are all muted, so if you want to just type them in, and then we'll we'll grab them at the end um, when we're asking from questions from everybody. Thank you all for being here. Uh, very much on Palm Sunday, um, and thank you, Nancy, for that generous introduction. Uh, 
Uh, and I encourage you all to uh, thank you for supporting the Augusta County Historical Society and encourage you to continue to do so. I've been uh, very impressed by the organization both before and after becoming a board member. And uh, I think uh, there, there are many programs as you've seen before and many more to come that I think are be uh, of very wide and um, intense interest. What I'm going to do is share the screen here. If you will bear with me one moment. This takes just a little doing. I don't know how I get rid of this. I'll just leave that right there. Okay. What I'm going to talk about today are these 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 very I think enigmatic monuments, and you'll see here, that's the term I've used, that's the way I want you to think about these Native American burial mounds. Uh, there's still a lot we don't know about them, and one of the problems is because of the way they were investigated. Most of them were excavated uh, before the era of modern archaeology, but there's still sufficient evidence uh, out there to allow us to piece together the story. Now there are many ways that one could address the story. We could take one mound, for instance, and uh, unpack it and talk about its individual story. What I've chosen to do today is try to present to you the bigger picture, all right? Talk about the cultural picture, uh, and in the end of it, hopefully you'll have a sense of the people uh, that were responsible for these mounds and the way they changed over a period of time. The Shenandoah Valley is an interesting place in terms of its Native American history. And one of the curious aspects of it is when the first Europeans arrived here, the valley was largely depopulated. They did not encounter a great number of Native American people. And that was even a bit, a bit of a surprise to the early settlers that arrived here. So one of the questions uh, that was left to uh, be answered was, had there ever been much of a Native American presence in the Shenandoah Valley? Well, the answer is, of course, yes. And we only have to go back a century or two prior to the, the arrival of the first Europeans to find evidence of that. But I want to make sure that it's clear in your heads when you leave today, by the time you disconnect today, if you're watching from Zoom, is... When were these Native American burial mounds built? Why were they built? Who built them? Where were they built? And then one of the questions that's intrigued me more and more is, why are they here? And a, and, and a question that's it's really interesting is, if we look at the distribution of the mounds, you'll see in a moment, they don't occur everywhere in Virginia. They don't occur everywhere up and down the Great Valley. But there's this peculiar concentration right here, which begs the question, why is that so? What accounts for that concentration of these Native American burial sites in this location? All right. Well, let's sort of begin with some basics here. When people talk about Indian mounds, that's a term that gets used really loosely. And if you don't know it, there are many kinds of Indian mounds. And they occur over a wide area in our country. And so I just want to walk through you what the different kinds are so it's clear to you that what the nature of the ones in our location are, comparatively speaking. 
this. I don't know how to get rid of that. The most common type of, of, uh, of these monuments that we see of Native American construction throughout, we we'll call it Eastern North America from roughly the Mississippi River all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, from Southern Canada all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico are mounds of this sort. They're kind of like haystacks, right? They're sort of rounded top mounds. We call them conical mounds. And they were the kind that were constructed for the longest period. And most, almost always, they were constructed for burial purposes. As we'll see in a moment, not every monument that was put up by the native people was for burial purposes. But these were, and this, in fact, is the kind that would have uh, occurred in, in our area. We don't see them today, regrettably, but they were here. Uh, a really interesting but relatively rare kind of monument created from earth by native people 2,000 or more years ago in most cases are what we call these effigy mounds. And they've provoked all kinds of theories about uh, what and why because you don't have a full appreciation of what they look like unless you're uh, observing them from some altitude. But nonetheless, uh, they're, they're effigies of snakes, uh, like this famous one in Ohio, there are others of other ki of all sorts of animals that you see in places like Wisconsin and so on. There are none of these in our area, but they are a type of mound that occurs in eastern North America. Another type are these odd embankments and enclosures. It, and the, the native people were creating uh, enclosures that were shaped like circles, they were shaped like octagons, they were creating avenues that sometimes would run miles and miles and miles and connect locations with more of these enclosures and embankments. And the places we see most of these are in uh, the Ohio Valley. And most of these are 2,000 years old. Really, really interesting ceremonial locations. Then the most recent kind are these, and we call them platform mounds. They started to appear roughly about a thousand years ago. Now, occasionally there were people buried in these mounds, but for the most part, these flat-topped pyramids, which is really what they are, were created to support special buildings. So you want to look at them as, as the platforms uh, for temples and the houses of chiefs. So you look at this famous one out in in Illinois near St. Louis. Uh, you look at the flat top, you need to imagine that there was a, an important structure on the, on the top of this thing. Well, there are many types of mounds that were created here. Now, here's a famous map that was put together at the end of the 19th century in a Smithsonian report that shows all the known, roughly all of the known uh, earthen monuments created by Native American people uh, throughout eastern North America. And you can see there are places on that map where they're very high density. They're very common. But what I've done is circled our area, and you'll see that the density of these mounds is very low. There just aren't many of them. The Shenandoah Valley tends to be outside, okay, the area where this mound building activity tends to occur. That, again, begs the question is why, though, did we have this sort of peculiar concentration of mounds here where most of this activity was elsewhere. So that sets the stage geographically uh, for what we're talking about. Now these, these mounds have been a source of debate for a long time and uh, there have been a lot of misperceptions about what these mounds represent and I'll just share with you some of this, the sense of that. Uh, there, there are thousands of these things. And during the westward expansion in our country, as people started to flow from the east, from places like Virginia into the Ohio Valley, they began to encounter these things over and over and over again. And for them, it's like, who's responsible? Now, at that time, uh, Native Americans uh, posed problems for the westward expansion. There was a tremendous amount of prejudice against Native Americans. And there was this, this uh, dilemma. Is what do we do? How do we justify our westward expansion? Okay, when we have Native people here 
in our midst, claiming ancient ties to these lands, claiming even responsibility for some of these mounds. Well, some odd theories arose uh, that said uh, the Native Americans could not have been responsible. And this became the popular idea, especially in the early part of the 1800s. People were dismissing any notion that Native Americans could have been the ones who actually put these mounds up. If you could establish that argument, if you could make that claim, it was much easier, right, to displace the natives from these places where their monuments were existing. Uh, here's one from a report, a famous report, a study of these. It says, uh, as works of art, and talking about these mounds, they're beyond anything that the native North, North Americans are known to produce today, which was true. At that time, natives weren't building these mounds in the same way, and so people made, made um, the argument that if that was true, then it was never true. Uh, and this goes on uh, and on and on. Uh, here's an, uh, a quotation from a popular textbook in the mid-19th century uh, that says it's far more probable that the first settlers of America were from Egypt. Yeah, Phoenicians, Egyptians, lost tribes of Israel, anybody but the natives. <laughs> and in fact, the theory was, if you, if you look into this history, which is pretty fascinating, is that it was, it was these groups like the Egyptians and the Phoenicians who put up these remarkable mounds, and the natives that we know today uh, annihilated them in a great battle, okay? And uh, that explains the, the gap that people were curious about. And here you see um, even uh, President Andrew Jackson uh, during his State of the Union address in 1830, uh, who was confronted, right, with what he would call the Indian problem, uh, was making the same argument, that these more memorials of a once powerful race were exterminated by today's Native Americans. So uh, people have been literally mystified about the meanings of these burial mounds. Now, I think it's probably impossible to give a talk about anything in Virginia without making some reference to Thomas Jefferson. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that should be maybe the goal one day to be able to do that, but the man was such a, a polymath uh, that he too was smitten by this question of what the, these burial mounds were. And in his famous book on uh, Notes on the State of Virginia, he spent, spent uh, a good bit of time contemplating what they were. And these are just some of his remarks, but he says uh, that they're found all over this country, okay? And they're different sizes. They're mainly constructed of earth. Occasionally, they're piles of stones. But he says it's clear that they were, for, they were built as repositories for the dead. And Jefferson, in fact was the first European we know of to, we call it scientifically, excavate one of these burial mounds. The land he inherited from his father over there on the other side of the Blue Ridge actually had one of the mounds on it that we're going to talk about. And Jefferson, in his infinite curiosity, decided to go in and excavate it and try to sort of literally get to the bottom of it. And that's where he understood that these became uh, burial sites. So there's a, this rich history uh, surrounding uh, these, these Native American mounds. And there were other people trying to answer the same questions. Here's a famous painting. This particular uh, conical mound, burial mound, is out in the Mississippi Valley, but it gives you a sense probably of what Jefferson was seeing as he was going through uh, making his own exploration. So th that's sort of the, the where and the what in a way uh, but let's give a little bit of context for what were the Native American people like who did build these mounds in this area. They weren't building these mounds for the full span of Native American occupation in this area. We know as archaeologists that people occupied Virginia, including the Shenandoah Valley, for at least 15,000 years. 
15,000 years. It was only a tiny sliver of that time, at the end of that time, that they were building these burial mounds. And it occurred during a period after about 1,000 years ago, uh, we call the late woodland period that they were doing that. And there were some really interesting changes going on that help us understand why these mounds were built uh, that kind of define the late woodland period. One of the big changes is this was the first time, this was the first time native people, not just in Virginia, but throughout much of the country, finally became settled. It's the first time they had a mailing address. Prior to that, they were roving constantly throughout the year in search of food. This time, they became settled in villages, they became farmers, and they developed a new attachment to the land. And so this is the kind of picture you would think about in terms of the residents of these, of these villages. Now, who were these people? That's a much harder question to answer. As I mentioned, when the first Europeans marched into the valley, generally from the north, they found nobody home for the most part. So we have to go back a little bit earlier to get a sense of who some of these native groups might be. This is an excerpt, sort of a, a, a zoomed view of the famous map from John Smith. And you can see out in the far western reaches, okay, where this upper margin of his map would be about where the Blue Ridge is, he notes two groups, the Monicans, which are still around today, right? Uh, and then another group called the Manahoic, which would have been up more up closer to the um, Rappahannock headwaters and uh, perhaps into the Potomac. So this was the best we could do at the time is to understand who was uh, at home at the time some of these mounds may have built. Maybe they were ancestral groups, in other words, to the, the Monacan. And certainly that is a claim that's made by University of Virginia uh, professor Jeffrey Hanton. So the first thing I want to do is just go through what some of the basic facts are about the mounds. As I've mentioned, they're unique to the west central part of the state. Uh, there are about 13 of these burial mounds in that area. When I say that area, we're talking about roughly from uh, um, Rockbridge County up to Rockingham County, from Bath County over into Augusta County, and then even into Albemarle for a short while. They were built over several centuries. If we think about the full span of Native American history in the state, not so long, but still, uh, once they started to be built, over a number of centuries. But I, one of the, uh, the key points that I want you to appreciate by the time we're done is that they changed over time. It's not true that you've seen one mound, you've seen them all. They underwent this interesting evolution which is indicative of some interesting changes in Native American society. One of the changes is the timing of the usage, uh, geographically speaking, the way they were built, and then the way people were buried inside these mounds changed over time as well. As I mentioned, most of these are very poorly documented uh, from the perspective of modern-day archaeology. If we wander around Augusta County, Rockbridge County, Rockingham County, Bath County today, you will not see these mounds. They're gone. They've been leveled by all kinds of, fa all kinds of forces and activities. So I've sort of worked hard to try and find an image for you uh, that would be, I think, uh, representative of what used to be in this area that we're talking about. And here's one over in West Virginia that's actually in a historic cemetery. But you can see fairly low mound of earth, not a great big giant thing, uh, but there they are. The red area in this map shows where we're talking about. The white star I've tried to place at about where we're sitting here in the Wayne Theater uh, so this is the concentration of burial mounds in Virginia. If you go in the far southwestern corner of the state, you start to see a different kind of burial mound tradition. So there is another cluster in western Virginia. You've got to go way down toward Lee County and places of that sort. And there, in that where that gray patch is, is where you get platform mounds, these flat-top mounds 
that had temples on the top of them, okay, that started to be built about 900, 1,000 years ago. But they're different disassociated sets of activity. All right. Here's a closer view of the area that we're concerned with, and I've tried to label this map so that you'll be uh, oriented. Uh, that black line there is essentially the front of the Blue Ridge, call it the Appalachian Range, uh, which divides the Piedmont from the Ridge and Valley. Provinces, physiographic provinces, I've put uh, stars for Stanton and Charlottesville today, and all those blue dots indicate where these different Indian mounds occur in what we'll call this concentration. Uh, here's the same map that shows uh, the locations of the mounds as larger dots. So you can see they're fairly tightly clustered, especially as we zoom out from um, the close-in view. This is a, a an old, old illustration from the 19th century that shows a cross-section look at what these mounds look like. And the main takeaway for you is that if you slice one in half, which is the way a lot of them were excavated, you do see differences internally, which suggests that the activity, the nature of the activity when the mound was first built was different from the activity that occurred when it was uh, abandoned. The soil is different, the things that are inside the mound and those, those layers are different as well. Here's a view again trying to give you a visual sense of what these mounds look like. This is one from Pennsylvania that's probably not unlike uh, a number of the mounds that we would see in our area. Uh, and this is one that's been under excavation and using that cross-section view. So I've mentioned these mounds have, have been evocative. Uh, they have provoked all kinds of curiosity in our area, and that, in fact, accounts for why there aren't many around anymore. People have loved them to death. People have been so <laughs> interested in what they're about that they've excavated them away. Uh, this is uh, an excerpt from the Stanton Evening Leader uh, in May of 1832, and it's written by a Reverend David Glovier, and uh, he was witnessing the excavation of one of these mounds just outside Stanton, as he said, about four miles outside Stanton. I think this is the one we call the Lewis Creek Mound, which would be east of the city. And you, you can read it for yourself, but it's, it, it's worth looking at, is that even in the 1930s, people were unsure of what they were seeing and what these things meant. And you can imagine a, a man of, of religion would probably really meditate in a deep way what these sites of burial might have meant to these people in the past. He says, as I stood by the open mound and looked at the large number of human bodies thrown out with dirt, excavated, and others protruding out of the sides of the bank around the excavation, I asked myself, whose bones are these and from whence, and how came they here? We have a history here within four miles of our city that's never been written. That was largely the truth until about the 1970s and 80s. And even today, it's a work in progress. Okay. All right. Here is a, this is a mound near Rockbridge Baths. There's been a lot of research about these mounds by a few people prior to me, one of whom was a graduate student named Gary Dunham. He was a UVA graduate student and wrote his dissertation in 1994. And so some of the illustrations that I'm going to show you come from his wonderful dissertation. But he uh, did a deep dive into the history of a lot of these mounds, and he shows us Kind of the changes that occur. This would be the mound in its beginning, its first stage. Then it grew to something about like this. And then uh, around the year 1850, it started to lose size. Why did it start to lose size? People were plowing them down. A lot of these mounds occur in, in uh, river bottoms and creek bottoms where the best soil is. 
and people were plowing right over the top of them, and that plowing activity leveled them out. In other cases, people were both plowing over the top of these things and plundering the mounds to see what was inside. And so by, in 50 years later, uh, in 1901, when the Valentine Muse Museum went there to excavate the mound, it was probably not more than about knee high. So it had gone from something like this down to something like that in, say, a uh, hundred years or so. All right. There are two major periods of mound construction and use, and they're both very different. It's really interesting to think about why that is. The first of these periods was a time when the mounds were reserved for a few select people. Not just anybody could be buried in those mounds. And this period occurred uh, for, say, the first two or three centuries of their creation and use. And this is the time when we see in the mounds, in addition to human remains like skeletons, artifacts like stone smoking pipes, uh, arrowheads, shell beads, and so forth. So not only were these important people placed inside the mounds, but they were placed in the mounds with things that they, that were signs of their status. All right, and they were placed in the mounds one at a time. You died, you had enjoyed a particular status, you were buried in these special locations, one at a time. Funeral, 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 in a sense, okay, as they occurred. All of these older mounds, the older mounds occur here. They occur in the valley. This is the first place that this mound building tradition happens. In fact, these burial places, and we don't know why they were chosen. This is still a really important issue. Um, did not have mounds at all. They became Native American cemeteries, and here is a mound, um, this is what we call the Middle River Mound, which is near Churchville, Churchville, Virginia. When the Middle River Mound, and this is, this, this is not unique to this mound, but it's, it's emblematic of a lot of these mounds, it became a cemetery site for Native people. And it was used that way for some period of time, and it was only later that the mound continued to be built. So in this left-hand diagram here, what you see are a group of native burials that were placed below the level of the natural soil, the common natural level of the ground, just like we would bury somebody today, but they were buried in this concentration. Later, uh, as the mound was being excavated, it came to be realized that other people were placed more or less on the top of the ground or very close to it. So you had these original group of burials, then you had these additional burials slightly above them. And it was only after that that the mound began to be built. These are all of the graves that were identified inside the mound near Churchville. So there are dozens and dozens and dozens of people buried in this mound, but they accumulated over a period of time. All right. When people were placed in these early mounds, they were buried in, I don't know how to get rid of this thing, and I apologize, but at any rate, um, they were buried in two kinds of ways, and they always involved putting them in a, what we call a flexed position. It's basically like a fetal position. The knees were drawn up to the chest, and they were placed in the ground. In the earliest period, this was done while the body was still intact. Flesh was still there. Later, the practice changed. The body was stored somewhere temporarily. After most of the flesh was removed, then they were placed in the ground as bundles. But the key is they were always uh, buried as individuals. Okay? In these early years, the numbers, relatively speaking, of people in these cemeteries and mounds were fairly small. And what I want to do now, I, I've created these graphics to sort of give you a kind of a cartoonish look at how this all worked. So this would be 
this chosen place before the first burials were put in. Okay, so here would be the ground surface. First burials were placed here as individuals in graves below the ground. Later, there were individuals placed on top of the ground, oftentimes covered by these small stone piles. Okay? Cemetery, people on top of the ground covered with stone piles. All right. Then you had the addition of an, what we call an earth mantle on the top of that, and you were still adding these individuals. Okay? So now we've got an earthen mound after probably a century or so, and... Uh, this was the, the, the way they grew in this first period. Individual burials is the key. I mentioned earlier that some artifacts are found with these individual burials. We think the people who were placed in these, in these locations tended to be folks of some higher status, perhaps leaders, something of that nature. But not just anybody had the privilege of being buried in these special cemeteries. Uh, the kinds of artifacts would be stone pipes like this, which is the sort of thing that often did, uh, was indicative of, of status. Uh, these fairly elaborate bone hairpins uh, were also the kinds of things that show up in these, these higher status graves. The second period, things changed radically. There was some kind of really remarkable shift in the Native American culture and the way they chose to bury their dead. And the major shift was that, there, that, uh, that just about anybody, or certainly many more people in the society, became eligible for burial in these mounds. And rather than have these periodic individual uh, funerals, we'll call it, there were uh, periodic cemeteries where Sometimes dozens of people were buried at one time. Based on estimations uh, from excavation evidence, these, uh, these uh, mass burials occurred about every 7 to 12 years. They're what we call secondary burial. Everybody that was, that was buried in the mound at, in these events had been stored somewhere for some period of time. Upon death, you were put in a special building called a charnel house, and your remains were kept there until the time that these burial occasions were scheduled. And this is what we call secondary burial. You died, your remains are stored, then your remains are buried, sometimes many, many years later. The average number of people that were buried in these events was about 25 individuals. And people were mixed together. If you go into these mounds and you see the, 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 the human bones that are result from these kinds of events, they're, they're mixed. It's very hard to untangle one person from another. A common pattern that's been observed is that the long bones, right, your arm bones, leg bones, were bundled up together, placed in the ground, and then the skulls, from these individuals that were buried there were placed in a circle around those. Okay, so there was kind of this interesting ritualized deposition that was occurring. And what's really interesting about this, and we find almost no artifacts, all of a sudden they weren't putting anything in the ground with these individuals. No pipes, no beads, no bone hairpins, nothing like that. Okay. It's the same location, it's the same mound, but these activities were occurring in a new earthen mantle that was built on top of all of those earlier ones where the individual burials were. Here's a diagram of what we talk about, and we call these mass graves ossuary burials. And there are these, these tremendous collections of bones of, of many people. This is a, a drawing of one of those, those kinds of features. And then here you see uh, groups of those uh, bones as well. And so uh, what I've done in this image is just to show you these mounds in this later stage and you'd have uh, a group of 25 or so deposited, another group of 25, 25, 25, and that's how these mounds grew upward and outward during these uh, periodic rituals every 7 to 12 years. 
this was something that was noticed for a long time in these excavations. People didn't really understand what it meant, but it was observed. This is a sketch from 1932 of the Lewis Creek Mound, which is uh, not terribly far from, from Stanton. And you can see the person who drew this sketch was showing these, these um, concentrations, many, many uh, human bones. Uh, this is a mound over near, closer to Charlottesville in Albemarle County that shows the same sorts of clusters of these long bones and then these sort of somewhat circular arrangements of skulls in and around the same features. This is a, a chart. I just want to make the point about the change from Gary Dunham's dissertation. And over here on this margin is a timeline. Uh, I'm sorry, over here in this margin is the number of people buried in the mounds, and these are the different mounds across the bottom. This earlier period, you tend not to find more than a two or three hundred people buried in a mound. Okay? The mounds that were used in the second phase, when they were installing dozens at a time, you can have up to a thousand people buried in these mounds. So there are a number of these mounds where the total number of human burials is well over a thousand. In a couple of cases, there have been estimates of two or three thousand. Okay. All right. I mentioned at the beginning that there were shifts in time and that the older uh, mounds tended to be in the valley. And this map I created just to show you that general trend. So the darker blue circles would be the older mounds. This would be our area. And then over the centuries of mound usage, there is a shift. So you tend to get the younger ones uh, closer to the Blue Ridge, but on either side of the Blue Ridge. And that's where the first time you start to see them on the east side in places uh, generally in the vicinity of, of Charlottesville. Then there's one mound down here um, that uh, we believe to be the very latest of all, most likely. All right, let's talk now about how we explain the locations of these mounds. This is something that's intrigued me, is why in the world is this happening here and not anywhere else? Um, I've looked at a number of factors trying to understand uh, what the pattern is. Uh, I'll, I'll bring this map up again. Uh, at the time uh, Jamestown was settled, there was no knowledge of native people on the west side of the Blue Ridge, so we don't have much to work with there. Um, it's hard to pin a name to it. In other words, we don't know that a group was there that was responsible for building these mounds. So we have to kind of resort to looking at some other factors. Uh, one of those that intrigued me is the, the realization that these mounds were all built at the headwaters of the rivers. It's like the river divide. And this is a map that I've created that shows the Potomac Shenandoah watershed here. This is the James Rappahannock watershed, and then over here you get sort of the o Ohio Valley, Mississippi-oriented watersheds. If we plot the mounds, you'll see they occur very close to where these rivers originate. Okay? They occur close to where these rivers originate. It's like the origin point, the beginning point. Okay? for these great rivers. I've also looked at the archaeological information that we have at our disposal today and asked the question, where were populations concentrated at the time these mounds were built? Where were the big villages? Where were most people have been living? And these sort of lavender pink circles is where people were living. If you wanted to find Native Americans at the time the mounds were built, this is where you would have to go. And as it happens, we do not see, we do not see major villages 
major concentrations of people where these mounds were built. So that begs the question. Sort of intuitively you would think that the mounds would be concentrated where the people were. At, just to help you understand why the people were where they were, you, the, car, the, the, the equation for archaeologists is big water, big villages. You want to find where Native Americans were calling home and building their primary villages. It's going to be on the, the lower parts of rivers where you have uh, more water, more resources, more floodplain soil. That's not what we're talking about here. Here again, if we look historically, based on the information we've had about where known Indian villages were, uh, we can see the Monacans here on the east side of the Blue Ridge, the Monahoics, the Powhatan way down here in Tidewater, what we think generally was Shawnee territory out here in the Alleghenies and west of that. Nobody home where these mounds were, so far as we can tell. What's the explanation? I'll share my theory. Well, let me go back. If we look around the world uh, at other cultures, you could go to Europe, you could go to Asia, you can go to Africa, it doesn't matter where you go. Uh, we see cultures assign meaning to places on the landscape that are points of what they would call power or enigma, and they often tend to be places of transition and boundary. Okay? These drainage divides were exactly that sort of a place. They were a place of beginnings, right? Origins. And we think about death, there's a, a tremendous focus on transition. It's a transition from life to death. And my guess is that there was some kind of a symbolic connection between this location where these rivers were or originating, where you had boundaries between these different groups that linked to notions about life and death, renewal, uh, beginnings and endings. And uh, so the, the mounds are... are, are established as, as monuments to the living that allow people to connect the living culture with the ancestors, the new to the old, birth to death. And there's really no better place to do it on the landscape than this kind of a divide uh, at the headwaters of these, these streams. So that's what I think is going on there. Um, And as I mentioned before, uh, during this late woodland period, this is the time that cultures for the first time become, they, they link their identity with particular places and uh, establishing these monuments in these kinds of locations is one way of, of doing that. So I will stop there and um, open it up for questions. Yes, sir. Hopefully, we switch to you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. But first of all, these mounds, of course, have. Okay, these mounds have a, a lot of dirt, high mounds. Do you see around them any indentations where they excavated the? material to go on the mounds or did they bring it in from some other location rather than right where the mounds were? Yeah, we, we call those borrow pits and uh, in most places where you have big mounds you can see borrow pits. Okay. 
And, but we, that's never been described for any of these. It's never been described for any of the ones in our area. And again, I have to emphasize that with almost every exception, these are not excavated by archaeologists as we know it today. <laughs> um, and so the records and the observations that people were making about the details of these mounds are not as clear as we would like for them to be. So we've had to put together this story from some pretty sketchy information. My guess is that there would have been borrow pits. We simply don't see them. Now, one thing that might be possible is to go back and research some of these mounds again. That would be a really interesting project. We know where they were, and uh, it would be possible to uh, start an excavation and look for those borrow pits. If they're there, we would see them. Okay. Well, one other thing. I live in the general area of the Lewis Creek Mount, mm -hmm. maybe five, ten miles away. I, I have a farm that's right on Christian's Creek, if sure. you're familiar with Christian's sure. Creek. And over the years, uh, you can go out in my garden and you can find all kinds of points and chips. And I, I, years ago, we found something unusual, uh, larger than that. And I don't know whether that would be something that would have been in a uh, ceremony or, uh, or what kind of... Uh, it's, it's unusually large. It's like a tomahawk, if you would call right. it that. And uh, is that something that would be, where it is is in uh, an area that would have been excavated for years and years. Sure. It's, it's bottom land where it was our garden right. when we discovered that. Right. And um, how old would, have this, would something like this have been in this age or much older? There's nothing that we know of from this particular culture of this period that matches that. So my guess is that that's older than these mounds. I was told by one of your colleagues years ago who had a program here that it was might have been pre-Clovis. Possibly. Um, what he's talking about is uh, this period 15,000 years ago or so when you really had the true pioneering people showing up in this part of the world. So that would be one of the oldest artifacts you find. That, that piece you have there doesn't like it would go with these mound builders, but I just want all of you to know that most of you, if you've ever found a, say what we call an arrowhead in a garden or you know somebody that has one, the vast majority of those are much, much older than these burial mounds. If you find a stone artifact associated with these burial mounds, going to be a tiny little triangle. And a lot of people call them bird points. So the arrow points from this period are tiny little things. Okay? The telltale sign of, of, of these groups are those tiny little points and pieces of ceramic pottery. I've found many of those. Yeah. And if you have, if you have ceramic pottery, then you might have something that's related to these folks. Thanks for. I have this actual thing outside if you like to see. Oh, sure. It'd be fun. <laughs> Why do you think people did not choose to live in the Shenandoah Valley, the Indians? Yeah. Well, they certainly did in these earlier periods. Certainly did in these earlier periods, and and I and I, I want to be clear. We, it doesn't mean the entire valley, it's just in this headwaters territory. We don't see the big villages. Um, we see the big villages. Uh, you have to go up closer to Front Royal, uh, and then on the Potomac itself, and then you would go farther downstream on the James River and so forth. You'd start to see those those big sites. And I think it has to do with uh, the, the, the needs, the requirements of being a successful farmer. And uh, these folks were very keyed into large expanses of bottomland. And the places you're going to find these largest expanses of bottomland, the best farming soil, are going to be downstream from where we are. Stanton is not endowed with that kind of a landscape in the same way that you would find it anywhere. 
So they, they certainly would have been passing through and maybe spending a short periods of time in this area, but it wouldn't have been the same kind of uh, major population concentration. That was different in these earlier periods. Now, if you, if you look around uh, this part of the valley uh, where the divide is between the Shenandoah system and the James system, lots of activity, lots of activity, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago tell when you do an excavation what the tribe was? Almost never. Uh, we tend to say ancestral to this group or ancestral to that group. Uh, the general thinking now is that uh, the populations that were building these mounds were probably ancestral to the Monicans. Uh, the Monicans today uh, still certainly still exist. They're very proud of their heritage and their, their population is mainly concentrated between uh, closer to, toward Lynchburg, Bedford County and those, those areas. Would, would that be Siouan? Siouan speakers. Yeah. Yeah, they were sp speakers of the Siouan language. Yeah. Other questions? Do we have any questions on the on the um, chat box or the Facebook? Hi, hi, Nancy. No, no, we don't have any questions. Okay. We don't have questions on Facebook. <laughs> okay, on the chat, I guess we could. Let me see what I have here. Here, okay. Uh, one question that's on the chat is, do you think there would have been many more mounds? And, you know, it's possible. Uh, I, I wouldn't say many more, but there's possible there were some that we never knew about, some that never were reported. I think the pattern we see is probably pretty real, that they were concentrated in this area, at least these burial mounds. Says these burial sites are common to Mississippian Indians. Is it possible our local burial mounds are a result of migration among those tribes? Uh, that's an interesting uh, point. Is that I do one of the questions is what inspired the native people in our area to begin building mounds at all, and to having these designated cemeteries, and in the beginning are uh, relegated to people probably of some higher status. Uh, that is a, uh, a custom of these Mississippian cultures who uh, developed to a degree that we haven't seen, didn't, hadn't seen before and hadn't seen since. And those, those, uh, that small number of mounds in southwestern Virginia that I mentioned were the products or the creations of these Mississippian cultures. And they began to be built exactly the same time the mounds in this area started to be built. So I do have a suspicion that there was some kind of influence or inspiration from these Mississippian groups, okay, that perhaps led to the creation of these mound building activities in this area. So I think that's the connection, but I don't think it's more than uh, an influence. I don't see... Other, other questions? You... Scroll up. Uh, there's, there's one here at the bottom that says, uh, are any of these mounds publicly accessible to visit in person? Are they now protected from plowing and plundering? The answer is no and no. Um, uh, all of these mounds are on private land, to my knowledge, and... Um, Generally speaking, uh, archaeological sites on private land are not protected per se. Okay? They're not protected. Uh, however, there are laws at both federal and the state level that protect burial sites. Okay? So it isn't legal to go in and plunder cemeteries, but uh, if there were any human remains left, then it would become uh, a legal issue. Let's see. 
Here's a, a question. Do the bones indicate that people of all ages and genders were buried together? For the most part, yes. This is particularly true in this, this latter period. We tend to see um, the full profile of the population, men, women, children, etc., in there. So it, it was, again, the point is it became uh, less exclusive kind of a burial ritual. I think. Dennis, I do have one from Facebook, if you'd like. Oh, sure. Um, is the point I see on your map along the Massanutten Range indicating the mound known as Indian Grave Ridge Mound? Did it have an earthen covering at one time? Today it appears to be only a rock pile. There, there are a few of these rock pile mounds around. We know even less about them. Uh, the stone cairn types of mounds that we do know about tend to date from an earlier period than this. So it would be a, a different culture. I think you've got one new one if you scroll down. Uh, there's a question here. It's a LIDAR seems to have been a very productive means of establishing sites. Elsewhere has it been used in relation to the mound cultures? Uh, LIDAR is, a, is, is really an acronym. It stands for Light Distance and Ranging. It's a laser-based mapping method that archaeologists have adopted widely, and it gives you an ultra-high resolution map of the Earth's surface. I mean, really high resolution map. And so, yes, we use this technology to search for archaeological sites, and if there's a mound there, we tend to see it. Uh, it has not been used in the Shenandoah Valley for that purpose, however. That's a project that's waiting to be done. Uh, right now, there's not, to my knowledge, there's not full coverage of the Shenandoah Valley, uh, but it could be, it could be created. Uh, another map, we have visited Cahokia, the very large mound you showed in Illinois. It's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site with a an interpretive museum, what are the possibilities this sort of recognition can be developed for any of the mound sites in Virginia? Well, the, you know, one of the points of this talk is to raise consciousness about the fact of these mounds and the cultures that created these mounds and um, the state of our knowledge. Uh, I think that there are some interesting um, there's interesting information that should be widely shared about these mounds, uh, even in a public forum. Uh, but if we were to undertake that kind of a, um, a process or undertake that kind of a project, one of the first things we'd want to do is, is uh, involve the Native American people, specifically the Monacan, and make sure that they were, were at the table and were being consulted as that kind of exhibit and interpretation was being done. Because they certainly linked their heritage to, to these sites. But uh, I think there, there are opportunities probably, uh, say, at the Frontier Culture Museum, where it might be possible to tell this story maybe a little more thoroughly, a little more clearly. Certainly the Frontier Culture folks do a good job interpreting late woodland cultures. This may be an aspect of it that could be developed a little bit more. So. Other questions? Uh, thank you all for coming. I think we need to give Dennis a big hand. Thank you. So if, if any of you all have ideas for programs or things you'd like to see us do, just uh, go to our website, email us. Get in touch with us, and um, there's lots of exciting history out there, and we want to jump in and do it. So, thank you all for coming, and and I hope it's not raining when you go outside. But um, enjoy enjoy the coming spring and the the coming um, ending of the pandemic. <laughs> exactly.